All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, and the, the most important um, Samuel Shem uh, rule, don't forget, is gomers go to ground. Remember that? Okay, it's a little, uh, little my favorite one. Um, so um, it's a great honor to be here. I wanna thank the meeting organizers for inviting me and um, it was a wonderful event last night. You, uh, the uh, Swedish uh, parting is, is, is the way I wanna do it for the rest of my life, I think. So um, here's my topic, uh, spin, lies, and truths, observational data in medicine and anesthesiology. And I have no conflicts, financial conflicts. Uh, uh, I look at my editorial role and wrap them as a, a volunteer fund um, uh, behavior, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty squeaky clean. Uh, I want to give a shout out to one of my uh, mentors, uh, Gil Welch uh, from the Dartmouth Institute. Um, he, I, had a, I had the luxury of going back to school about mid-career to get my uh, master's of science in, in public health. And he had this great saying that it's all about the denominator, which is like, is so true. Uh, and uh, I have one objective. In the United States, we really focus on, on, on learning objectives, and most, time, most of the time, people put up like 20. So I have a very, very s simple, singular objective. Uh, I want to uh, cite one really scary example where observational data got it wrong and people were injured. And I hope you can take that back home and share the story if you don't already know it. And I love this uh, quote from uh, Bill Watterson. I've got you to start listening to those quiet, nagging doubts. So what do we really want? And I think um, Dr. Angus spoke about this yesterday uh, uh, brilliantly. We, we want the truth. We are taking care of patients on the front lines. We like wanna know what to do like now. Uh, this is, it isn't good enough to wait 10 years to figure out the truth for our clinical behaviors. We want to know now. And I think most people are familiar with this triangle of truth, uh, and this is what we're taught in medical school. You go up this triangle and you have an increasing strength of, uh, of evidence. And um, the top of the triangle are systematic reviews. We talked a little bit, little bit about that yesterday. And of course, we learned about yesterday from Dr. Angus about these um, adaptive uh, point of care uh, trials, which probably are more aspirational in the future, which might be the, the, the key to the truth. But most of what we have now are systematic reviews that drive best practice guidelines and in, in our quote, evidence-based medicine. But below that is the bulk of the triangle. It's observational data. And it's in essence, uh, the definition of observational data is anything do that doesn't stem from a randomized uh, model. And it is everywhere, everywhere you look, you see observational data. It's in the classic cohort studies. In any quality improvement project that you've ever done, that's observational. In the United States, we do a lot of claims-based data. Uh, that's observational. Our EM EMR feeds and anything that's cost analysis uh, based, that's all observational. So the degree to which we can understand this data, process it, and use it in a rational way is going to be very advantageous to us and to our patients. You have to buy this book if you go on Amazon. It's like $3. Uh, you can read it in a day. It's the funniest book ever. This is written in the 1920s in the United States, and it gives you all the tricks of the trade that industry has used through the years to uh, try to get you to buy their products. And it, it describes it in layperson terminology, but you'll start being able to apply some of the statistical principles to, to some of the things that have happened in industry, and it's real fun. Now, just to set the stage and give you a flavor for this, because there's a lot of uh, fun stuff going on in American politics right now, but if you go back to the original um, uh, election between uh, the second election of Obama, um, Mitt Romney was running against uh, uh, Obama, and if you remember, it was predicted that Mitt Romney was going to defeat uh, Obama. And the reason why was because no president had ever won re-election when the unemployment rate was less than 8%. And it was hovering around 8.2%, uh, well, it was higher than 8%, it was hovering around 8.2%. So the Republicans were very, very excited. Now about a month before the election, the unemployment rate suddenly dropped to 7.7%, to and the Democrats were, were elated. Uh, the Republicans were, 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 were crying foul, something's going on here. And so you have to understand a little bit about how we calculate our, our unemployment rate. And so I just threw out some uh, kind of hypothetical numbers here. Well, let's say we had 82 people that were unemployed in a population of 1,000. That gives you 8.2% unemployment. If five people say, look, the economy is so bad, I can't find a job, I'm going to leave uh, and I'm going to go live in my parents' basement and smoke pot, uh, you would take them out of the numerator and by our definition, uh, and you would now have magically an unemployment rate of 7.7%. So it's really not good, but it looks good. So this leads me to my first um, point I wanna stress um, is that you have to understand what the definitions are. So definitions 
matter. And we see this game all the time played, especially with rare events like mortality or nerve injury. If you tweak the definition just a little bit, suddenly you don't have a problem. And um, how, how often have you heard, oh, that's not my complication, that's the surgeon's and vice versa. And so this stuff is real. So if you're trying to interpret uh, the findings of a, of a trial that you're reading uh, and you're just reading the abstract, make sure you really understand how they defined the outcome in particular. Um, and I want to take you now into a really dark story. So hormonal replacement therapy. Um, this, this is um, just a quite an amazing story. And if you recall, if you have a little bit of gray hair like uh, me, or even maybe more, well, back in the 1950s, this drug, and, and by the way, I want a full disclosure, this is a politically incorrect slide, so read the advertisement at your own, own peril. Uh, I only put it up here for historical perspective. Um, but hormonal replacement therapy was originally initiated in the 1950s, and this was an ad out of JAMA, uh, to treat uh, postmenopausal syndrome, um, and this 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 syndrome can be very de uh, debilitating, and, um, it, and and hormone replacement therapy is a very effective therapy for it. What's really interesting is that this drug therapy blew up into a multi-billion-dollar industry, and the use shifted from the treatment of disease. This is really important to the prevention of bad stuff in people who are healthy. So suddenly in the United States, and I believe across Europe and Scandinavia, millions and millions of women without disease were being exposed to this drug. And one of the um, studies that got a lot of attention in the press was this Cache County uh, study. It was, it's a county in Colorado, and they basically, it's a classic prospective observational study, and they observed women who did not uh, have um, uh, dementia, who were, who were taking uh, hormones and some who were not, and they followed them over time. And you can see here some of the, some got uh, dementia and some didn't, and uh, an analysis was performed, and a relative risk of, of, of developing uh, d dementia was, gener was generated here, and it was 0 0.33. So what does that mean? So a, a relative risk of 0 0.33 means that, in this case, there was a 67% reduction in the risk of developing um, d dementia if you are on hormone therapy. That's big news because uh, dementia is the number one cause of needing to go to a nursing home, massive expenditures, uh, uh, healthcare costs, and so if we could prevent that, it would be, uh, not to mention it's a devastating disease to, to patients and families, but if we could prevent that, it would be an amazing thing. That's, that gets headlines. So every leading uh, newspaper in the United States essentially was, was broadcasting uh, this, this finding. And um, I, I, I just want to regress for a second here uh, and, and highlight the fact that association with observational data does not prove causation. And I know most people have heard that, but you have to keep saying that because uh, you'll, you'll fall into to, to, to the error of, of, of making that assumption sometimes in clinical medicine. So for instance, if you had a data set with, with, with characteristics around drinking and depression, you could show that, that, that drinking is associated with depression. But, but could it be, in this example, that depression actually causes drinking? It, it could be. This is the kind of cause and effect uh, challenge. And in the p-value, the relative risk, the odds ratio, whatever statistical test that you want to apply to this doesn't know that. So you've got to be really, really careful. And there was a British uh, uh, epidemiologist who actually made the original connection between smoking uh, and cancer by studying physicians, he came up with these uh, criteria where you could, f if you could check off the box with each one of these, you could feel more confident that the observational data that you have is, uh, is more likely to be uh, uh, causal rather than uh, 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 just a, 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 an association. And I wrote the scientific term on the left here, and I like the layperson term. Um, so if you have an odds ratio that you're like, wow, that's huge, you know, threes and fours, that should get your attention. Uh, dose response, that's how you get into the New England Journal of Medicine when you're working with observational data. What I mean by that is that more of the exposure, more of the effect causes more of the outcome. That's very, very exciting. Biological plausibility, it's always good to have an argument for why um, there's a cause and effect. If you can't even come up with that, that's problematic. Consistency, lots of papers saying the same thing. Uh, the temporal issue is huge. In the case I, I gave you about drinking and depression, if people started with no depression, and you looked at the drinking, and they developed depression over time, that's a lot stronger than just a cross-sectional analysis. True experiments tend to be better than just database pulls uh, in, in, in general. Now, 
coming back to this hormonal replacement therapy story, it gets really weird. So, so suddenly uh, the story grows for um, 10 million women. Dozens and dozens of articles emerged suggesting that hormonal replacement therapy reduced a woman's chance of developing heart disease. And that's a big story, right? This is the number one killer of women. Again, headlines. Every leading journal uh, suggesting that this effect uh, was, 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 was important. Uh, in the, the, the um, JAMA in 1991, most but not all studies of hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women show about a 50% reduction in risk of coronary event in women using unopposed oral estrogen. In fact, uh, JAMA came out, and this is like pre uh, kind of computers doing everything. Uh, they came out with a fancy computer model where you could kind of put in your various uh, covariates and it would predict how many years longer you would live. Uh, I love this one. And, and so the, the, the conclusion was that hormone, hormonal replacement therapy should increase life expectancy for nearly all postmenopausal women with some gains exceeding three years. Sounds pretty good. Well, let's kind of fast forward uh, to the Women's Health Initiative study. This is a classic RCT. This is the coin toss. A huge study, well-funded, 16,000 some patients, half got HRT therapy, half didn't. Follow them over time, about five years. And this is, this is the findings right here. You can see in the, in, the, in the gray box. No change in death, a few less hip fractures, colon cancers. There were more MIs, strokes, DVTs, breast cancer. There was no change in sleep disturbance, depression, sexual satisfaction, energy, et cetera. The conclusion was it caused more harm than benefits. It caused more harm than benefits after all that. So now, if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the drug label, there's a black, black box warning that the drug actually causes the things that we thought it actually prevented, which is just absolutely um, amazing. And so don't forget about the original fuel, the whole dementia uh, argument. So there was another randomized control trial, coin toss, half got HRT therapy, half didn't. And a relative risk of dementia was uh, determined. And this time, and you remember earlier on it was 0.33, this time it was, it's two. So a doubling of the risk of dementia if you take these drugs. So what's going on here? So, I showed that relative risk of 0.33 at the beginning, and if you read that original paper, they adjusted, they did their fancy adjustment model, they got it to about 0.66, which is still a 44% reduction in, um, uh, in, in dementia. We do the RCT, it deals with all the unmeasured confounders, uh, and then bam, 2.05. That is a complete reversal, and really what's going on here is that um, there were ap it's apples and oranges, right? There were, there were things about women who were already on um, HRT therapy that were fundamentally different and that were unmeasured that could never be dealt with in a mathematical model. And that's, of course, the beauty of an RCT uh, that we've discussed throughout this, this meeting, but a complete reversal. Now, it's really fun, and I encourage you to do this. Look back at the discussion section of all these articles that have been proven to be wrong. Um, it's a little bit, uh, it's, 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 it's a little bit dark, but it's fun, but there's all sorts of fancy things in all these papers, you know, and they get into the, you know, the, the neurotrophic and neuroprotective influences, the enhancement of synaptic plasticity, and there's, you know, basic science models, there's biolog there's, there's, uh, molecular, uh, models, but the, the reality is, even though they appear as hard outcome, uh, as hard science, they are not hard outcomes. Now, this paper is brilliant, and I really highly suggest that you uh, uh, read it. It came out in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in 2013, uh, Prasad. And uh, it, basically what they did is they reviewed 10 years of high-quality articles coming out of the New England Journal of Medicine, and they compared those to gold standards and best practice advisories that were I in play at the time. And they basically uh, concluded that the reversal of established medical practice is common and occurs uh, um, across all classes. Uh, the, the, their investigation sheds light on low value practices and patterns of medical research. And they found that of the 363 gold standards, 146 were reversed. They were either wrong or harmful. And that's, a, that's about a 40% uh, rate. And I actually calculated the, the confidence interval around this 40% estimate, and it, 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 and it flirts with um, a 50%, so a coin toss. So think about that for a second. 
um, whether it's the ASRA, you know, recommendations on, on anticoagulation and, and neuroaxial procedures or whatever, you know, um, ERAS protocols, there's about a coin toss chance that it's either wrong or harmful. It's, it's, it's absolutely astounding. Don't forget anesthesia was in that article too, if you read it. Uh, there were two articles contraindicating the routine use of PA catheters. There were two articles that found worse outcomes with recommended glycemic controls. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Stenting of stable coronary artery disease re was reversed. Remember when we used to make recommendations to send people off for stents prior to various uh, surgical procedures? Routine um, um, uh, uh, arthroscopy for osteoarthritis uh, was, was, was not appropriate. Um, and I used to have a slide in there. All the vitamins were wrong, too. All those vitamins that we were, uh, people were taking for various things, they were all wrong. Um, so I, when I originally read that article, I'm like, well, what's going on here? Like, why is this happening? The authors um, didn't really commit to, uh, you know, one reason. There's obviously issues of potential fraud um, and, uh, and, and fake data. But, but, but really the theme that I... I believe was, is that a lot of these guidelines and best practices are based on flawed observational data. Now, I love working with observational data, and I just want to share that, you know, I, th I think it's healthy and, and, and good to use this data. You, you, you need to use it with, with rare outcomes. Uh, it's too expensive to run these massive uh, RCTs. Harmful treatments, you can't, you can't randomize people to known harmful treatments. Sometimes you don't have experimental control data, such as quality improvement data. Sometimes you want to do a hypothesis uh, generating exercise. That's a great reason to use observational data. And I also like it for validation of expert opinion in RCT work. Well, what do I mean by that? I'll come back to that in just a second. If you asked this question uh, several years back uh, and said, well, what should the target hemoglobin A1C be? You'd get a different answer from, 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 from a lot of different people. Uh, so I went through all the various uh, diabetic uh, associations and, and I, I found what they were recommending uh, uh, several years back. And I hope you like this slide because it took me like three hours to make this thing. So, um, but, but the reality is it was all over the place, okay? And, um, and there was finally a consensus statement, uh, best practice guideline that came out um, in the Annal Annals of Internal Medicine and it, and it, and it states... Uh, this, uh, to, prevent, to, to prevent microvascular complications of diabetes, the goal for glycemic control should be as low as feasible without undue risk for adverse events. So it's a 7% number, that's the, that's the reference point. Well, do we really know that, that that's good? Uh, number is that safe? Is tight kind of that tight seven percent uh, actually good on a population health level? So this this article was published in uh, the Lancet in 2010. Included more than 47,000 patients uh, from the National Health Database, uh, and they looked at um, uh, uh, relative risk of death as a function of 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 the uh, hemoglobin A1C. And you can see here um, the sweet spot, no pun intended, is uh, is 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 Basically, so here's the, here's the reference of 7.5. Uh, that's the best number um, because um, when you get lower, you you have a higher uh, relative risk of death, uh, and of course the, the the kind of the the higher levels have a higher risk of death. But this is seven is too is too tight, and probably what was happening here is people were getting hypoglycemic with the and then you know having neurological events, passing out, hitting their heads, et cetera. Um, but on a population health level, the recommendation was wrong. So here's a great role for observational data. And I, I put this slide in here because I want to make it clear, and as we, we learned from, from Dr. Angus on the first, on the first um, uh, lecture and yesterday, RCTs aren't perfect either. This, this was the fuel that, that, that basically drove the tight glucose movement in, in the United States and, and in Europe and Scandinavia. Uh, this was a huge randomized controlled trial that um, suggested that uh, tight uh, uh, glucose control in the ICU was, was beneficial. Um, and, um, and, and basically what happened is uh, bad stuff happened after this. Um, and uh, th th this, this, these findings translated into real world morbidity mortality. And there's been a bunch of kind of post hoc analys analyses of why, why this occurred. Um, and this, this was published, uh, this editorial was published in Anesthesia. Um, and uh, I think it's spot on. And their over enthusiasm to implement uh, these kind of tight glucose control um, protocols. Researchers and clinicians went overboard with their own half baked protocols. 
So this, this happens all the time, right? We, we see an RCT that we like and we have a completely different health system and we do something that doesn't even mirror what happened uh, in the original trial. And, um, and, and basically when you look back at that original uh, uh, study, there's all sorts of things that other people couldn't do. Uh, fancy pumps for delivery, um, ICU nurse training was completely different, um, how glucose was measured, how, how, how fasting occurred, how nutrition occurred. And we talked about this yesterday. Um, uh, this, is, this is external validity issues. You have to know, uh, does the study you're reading reflect your practice? Uh, and, it, and it's more likely than not in an RCT that there's gonna be a lot of differences. So in summary, um, does everyone know who the, this picture, by the way, who this is? This is uh, one of our, sil our sil silver medalist uh, in the Olympics for, um, I'm blanking. But anyway, so she, she's famous because she was really depressed. She didn't win the gold medal, so she was, she was, she was making that face when she got up on the podium. I, I'm blanking on the sport, but someone should tell me later. So anyway, she posed with Obama, and they kind of made this face, like, you know, kind of be skeptical kind of face. Anyway, um, so that's my message to you is uh, be skeptical. Unmeasured confounders are real, and there's multiple examples in, 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 in recent history where, where basically people were injured because of the lack of appreciation of unmeasured confounders. Fancy biological mechanisms are not proof of anything. You have to have hard, real-world outcomes. And I think, and this is Gil Welch's uh, um, kind of mentorship to me uh, from the Dartmouth Institute, if you're going to treat healthy patients, you should set the bar much higher uh, than sick patients because they only have, the healthy patients can only lose, especially when it's in the name of prevention. And I think this whole issue of pragmatic RCTs, point of care uh, RCTs, um, uh, adaptive RCTs are really probably the best way to get ultimately to the truth in the real world. Thank you very much.